Deep sea biology. Um, boy, deep sea biology is not an obvious career. When I was in, when I was a kid, I grew up on the Jersey Shore, exit 105 on the Garden State Parkway, and my mom used to take us to the beach. And so at the beach, that's where all the weird animals are, the horseshoe crabs, blue crabs, things that have more than two arms and hands and two pairs of eyes, you know, or <laughs> one pair of eyes. Um, they just have lots of different kinds of um, ways of making a living. And so I was curious about that. And then, uh, so, so I was really interested in marine biology. But then if you think about where the strangest animals are, I just had the sense that they were going to be in the deep sea. And so I wanted to study the deep sea. That's how I got there, was wanting to find those weird animals. Boy, you don't, you don't get into science without people. It's not, for me anyway, it wasn't a, a lonesome kind of thing to do. So I did it because of the people I work with. And it started way back when I was in high school. I, had a, um, I worked at a marine biology lab, and the fellow who was my mentor there was just fabulous. And, and, um, and he, he was the kind of person I wanted to hang around with. I liked his, who he was and how he, how he viewed the world. He was a, a senior scientist. And um, so then I went to, to Rutgers University to work with him. And um, so, so that person was very important in my career and thinking about, about life. But it's been, it's been mostly men who have been my mentors. Um, and I've never felt like being a woman was, you know, that, that there was anything special about being a woman. I was always just taken as, as um, a colleague and a, and a or, or a student at the, you know different times in my career, and just had lots of people who were ready to say, okay, you've gotten this far, but you know now here's the next step. Um, so I, I, it, it was professors all along the way who who pointed pointed me where to where to go. The challenge was not in being a woman. The challenge was the whole thing. The, the submarine, you know, I have, I have no, at the time I had no technical background. I was trained as a scientist, had just received my PhD in biology. And I work, I think the best training I had was working with my dad. I'd follow him around and he'd say, well, go get me the such and so kind of plier and I could at least run and go get a, a tool and knew how to use a screwdriver. Um, but just about everything was new for me with that submarine. So the whole thing from the power distribution distribution system, the, the mercury trim, the variable ballast. I had to learn all about uh, hydraulic systems, all, all the Navy safety procedures, just thinking thinking about troubleshooting, learning how to troubleshoot or imagine imagining uh, scenarios. And um, so, so the challenge was in all those technical sides of, of the training and, uh, and learning how to operate the submarines safely. So it, it didn't really have to do with my being a woman, the challenges. They, it had to do with it being a very complex machine and going to a dangerous place where you could kill yourself and others um, and, and needing to learn how to operate it without having any, you know, having that complete confidence of what you're doing and knowing the right right thing to do next if you got into trouble. And there was always something happening down there. <laughs> it is incredibly exciting to dive on the seafloor. So so I can qualify that though, I, I will in a second, but, but the idea to go somewhere where nobody's been before, I mean this is just one of the goals of my life. I just adore doing that. And, and, you, and you can do it so easily. You can go to look at a map and you can see the blank places on the seafloor. And, and we go to the mountain ranges where my research is. And so you can find the mountain ranges where nobody else has been yet and go down there and, and make discoveries. And, and so that's when you're in the submarine, it's, you have the small viewports to, to look out. Um, they're only, I think, four inches in diameter on the inside and then they flare out. But and you and, and the pool of light doesn't extend very far, right? So you can see about 20 meters ahead of you, if if that. And so you're constantly, if you're in exploring mode, you're constantly, or at least I'm constantly, just straining my eyes because I want to see that thing out in front of me. And, and it's partly in your head. You know nobody else has seen it. You just don't know what discovery you're going to make. Um, so so that aspect of it is 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 really exciting. Um, Sometimes, though, you can get into dives where you're just driving along mud, 
and I've had boring dives. Believe it or not, I've been on the seafloor and said, oh my God, you know, I can't wait for this dive to be over. That's after you've done three or four dives or half a dozen or a dozen dives, you, you, you know, you start to get jaded and then you only, only want those super exciting ones. But the first dive is always incredible. The first dive of your life, you'll never forget that, that diving down to the seabed. It's kind of ordinary, but it's extraordinary. So on the seafloor, there are black smokers. So black smokers are places where seawater's gone down into the ocean crust and then comes out superheated, 350 degrees Celsius, which is like 600 something Fahrenheit. And I was studying a, a little shrimp. So I'm a biologist, so I was studying a shrimp and the shrimp had this strange organ on its back. Well, one discovery was that this organ is in fact a very novel kind of photoreceptor derived from a normal shrimp's eye, like those black beady little eyes on your cocktail shrimp. But it made me ask, well, what are they looking at? The shrimp only are found on the sides of these black smoker chimneys where the hot water is coming out. So we wondered, could the shrimp be looking at light from the black smokers? The water so hot that it glows? So we went down with a special camera. There's a whole group of us who were thinking about this, but um, it all came from looking at this shrimp. And uh, we put this camera on a black smoker chimney right at the orifice, only about this big. Turned out all the lights in the submarine, let this camera take a picture. It's a, basically the same kind of um, camera chip as on your cell phone. And it just collected photons. And after five minutes, we got the picture, and there was light emanating from this black smoker. So there's geothermal, a geothermal source of light a mile, two miles down on the seabed. And so the shrimp led us to discover that. Isn't that cool? There's a famous um, New Yorker cartoon that, that has a bunch of ladies sitting around uh, sipping coffee, the coffee clutch in the afternoon, and, and the woman says, frankly, you know, I don't, I don't know why I should care about the deep sea. Or, and, it, and it's this idea that it's just, it's out of sight, it's out of mind, nobody, you know, why should you care? Well, there's, there's, a, there's any number of reasons. One of them is that we're learning about fundamental earth processes on the, on the seafloor, these hot springs, the mid-ocean ridges, these are things that control how the planet was shaped, is shaped, is, is being shaped. It's where, they're, they're places where volcanic activity is taking place, earthquakes. So if we understand how the dynamic earth works, you know, to, in order to do that, we have to be on the seafloor to see it and, and to make the measurements that we need. So in terms of the geology and geophysics of the planet, just understanding our planet, it's important. As a biologist, it's, it's, it's wanting to get an, we want to get an appreciation of, of what's there. Some of the um, animals and the microorganisms that we find, they have adaptations to extreme environments that can be, in fact, useful, that can be applied. And so while we're doing basic research, what we understand about an organism someday could pay off. And sometimes in terms of searches for therapeutic agents, drugs and, and um, other kinds of uh, medical purposes, or I have, in fact, I have some sunscreen that comes that ha includes some extracts from uh, isolates of hydrothermal organisms. Uh, I don't know what's so special about it, but they're in there. They get into cosmetics and other things. Uh, so I think it's trying to know, it's, it's part of it's an inventory of what's on our planet. Here's a whole frontier that hasn't been explored. We need to understand it. And then as we change our planet, as, as the climate changes, as um, we think about pumping CO2 down into the seabed as a place to, to store it and, and dispose of it, what impact is that going to have? What's, what functions, what services are taking place on the seabed that we rely on and don't even know that, that we use. So there's, there's any number of reasons why we need to understand processes, bio, biological, geological, chemical, because it's all, we're all part of one big planet. It's all interconnected. The oceans are as much connected to the atmosphere as, as, as land is, and so we need to understand how it all works.